Welcome everyone. This is the Global Watch International Prayer Room. Today is um, May the 16th and it is 3 p.m. Jerusalem time. This is the United Kingdom Watch with our host Barry and Brenda. And may the Lord bless and enrich each one that's on the call this day. So over to you, Barry. Bless you. Thank you, Sherry. And obviously a very warm welcome to all who can join us today. Um, we really just want to commit the whole time. We, I think we're probably all uh, close to the Isaiah 62 um, time of praying and fasting for Israel. And I think that's on our minds generally. But um, it's really just that we want to see that unity, don't we, all of us? We want to see uh, unity with the growing number of um, folk in Israel coming to know um, Yeshua HaMashiach as the, um, the Messiah who has been and is coming again. Um, so we, we are, I think we're in unity, and I think that's what the Lord's been showing us generally um, recently, that we all have to be in unity. It's the only way. It's the place of, of power in the kingdom as, um, you know, as Pentecost, when they were all gathered in the upper room. They were in a place of agreement and unity, and the power came down. Um, so let's um, just uh, commence with a, a prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, that you have um, called each one of us to be your um, watchmen, those who are looking with your lens to see what is coming and what is on your heart for us to take authority over in the name of King Yeshua. And uh, so, Father, we just um, want this time to be a time of glorifying the name um, of Jesus uh, in all of our words and Holy Spirit. We just say you are so welcome here and we ask that you will be indeed our counselor, our guide, um, that um, voice that comes to give us the understanding that we need, and that our eyes will be open to see what um, is being shown to us at the moment and ears to hear the voice of Yahweh himself. So, Father, we just um, give this time to you and we want to honour you by bringing this um, time of worship and honouring the name of Yahweh. Uh, we thank you. We thank you that you are Elohim, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. So we just um, hand this time to you now in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. So if you could, um, if you could play the first um, song, Surely that would be much appreciated. Thank you, Shirley, for facilitating that. So really over to um, Bernie and we just uh, we just appreciate you, Bernie, for uh, preparing this um, for us all to think on and to pray into today. So the reins are yours. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, everybody, and welcome to the session. Um, what I wanted to do today, um, bearing in mind the Isaiah 62 fast that many are doing, I wanted to look at the relationship between the UK and her relationship with Israel. And um, before we start, I'd just like to protect the session. Um, so Heavenly Father, in the mighty name be sure, we praise, honour and worship you. Uh, Lord, and we thank you for all your blessings, and we take this opportunity to put up smoke screens in the spirit that act as sight and sound barriers against interlocal satanic agents and evil spirits. And we thank you so much that we're able to come together as a global family to pray. We ask you to fill our hearts, our mouths, our minds with your words, that we may say what you want us to say and do your will, and bring your kingdom to rule and reign here on earth. Amen. 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 So um, if I quickly run through the agenda, um, I'm going to um, give a historical uh, perspective of the relationship of the UK and Israel. And I have to give enormous credit to Jonathan Stuart Brown, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with, who uh, furnished me with an enormous amount of comprehensive information, which I've very poorly summarized here. So please, any inaccuracies or anything, please blame on me um, because it will be my summary of the information. But thank you, Jonathan. And 
Um, if um, Jonathan's already very kindly agreed that if anybody wants the original message that he sent to me, which is a verbal message, then please just ask and we can forward it on after the meeting. So um, <clears throat> once I've gone through the historical perspective, I'd like to make a couple of declarations on behalf of the UK and remnant in the UK. Um, then we're going to break out groups and uh, I've got some prayer points for people and then once we're back from prayer, uh, break out groups I'll have a closing prayer and a worship song. So I think that's probably in line with what normally happens. So I'll start off with um, this historical perspective. So if we go right back to 70 AD when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem, and they took the Jews into slavery around the Roman Empire, which was massive at the time. Um, by about 130 AD, in the time of Emperor Hadrian, as in Hadrian's Wall fame, um, there were very few Jews left in Jerusalem. However, even though they were scattered around the Roman Empire, there's very little evidence to suggest that they were coming to Britain at the time. So our relationship with the Jews really begins in 1066 when William the Conqueror, who was the Duke of Normandy, who ruled Normandy and the Channel Islands, won the Battle of Hastings and took over Britain. William was much kinder to the Jews, that's relative to other people of that era, and he looked after them and used them as his bankers and administrators, and they were under his personal protection. And I don't know if many of you know, but the Battle of Hastings was the closest fought battle in history. And it's believed that God gave the victory to William because of his relationship with the Jews. So he looked after them and the first synagogue was built in England uh, in Plymouth in 1070. And the Jews spread across the country, many settling in London and York. And they, they lived under the protection of William. And uh, anybody who came against them could have their lands confiscated or be executed. So it was a time of relative, I say relative safety, because, you know, <laughs> in those days, we don't have the monitoring that we do nowadays. And so if you're in the middle of nowhere and people found you, you could still be um, terrorised, as many of the Jews had been. So anyway, this relationship continued for the next sort of 200 years until about 19, uh, 1290. And at that time, Edward I was uh, on the throne and he borrowed huge amounts of monies from the Jews to conquer Wales. Now, Edward was um, anti-Semitic, but he was also a fairly unscrupulous kind of chap and didn't want to pay back the money, so decided to drown the Jews rather than pay them back, which actually was the first Holocaust that took place. Um, any of it that remained, Edward exiled from England and Wales, and then when he went on to conquer Scotland and Ireland, um, he also exiled the Jews from there. So if the Jews were found in any of these territories, they were to be executed. And this approach lasted for the next 355 years. Jews were not allowed in England, Wales, Scotland and Ireland. And I have to say, all of these historical points that we're going to go through were a complete revelation to me. I never realised we were so awful to them. Anyway, um, our, our terrible treatment of the Jews brought curses from the Lord. And during this period, we went through the Hundred Years' War with France, where we lost millions of young men and we got nothing out of it. We also had the Black Death in the 1300s where one in three died. And between 1455 and 1485, we had the War of the Roses where two branches of the, of the royal family were fighting and killed each other for 30 years. And it was Henry VI who was responsible for that war, who again was not the best of kings. Anyway, all, all through this time, Jews were exiled from Britain and the kings that followed did nothing. So Henry VI, Richard III, Henry VII and Henry VIII, many of you will be familiar with him and his six wives, and his daughter Elizabeth I, who interestingly had a Jewish doctor, but nobody knows if she knew whether he was Jewish or not. Anyway, unfortunately, when it was discovered that he was Jewish, it didn't go terribly well for him. Elizabeth had no children, so the throne passed to James of Scotland, who was the author of the King James Bible. Then on to Charles I, who seemed to be a good Christian man, but even so, still didn't 
allow the Jews back to England. Civil war ensued and Charles I was beheaded and Oliver Cromwell, who was a Puritan and a godly man, albeit an autocratic dictator, took over in 1665 and very quickly allowed the Jews back into England. Um, meanwhile, in the 1650s and the 60s, there was a group of Christians who'd had a revelation on the prophecies in the Bible and believed that God was regathering his people and that the Jews needed to return to the promised land, even though Israel didn't exist at the time. And for the next 200 years, believers were praying for Alia. Believers included notables as William Wilberforce, Lord Shaftesbury, the Wesleys. But even so, during this time, the Jews and other nonconformists, such as the Catholics and the Methodists, weren't allowed to participate in public life, so still treated as second-class citizens. And that brings us up to 1815, where God gave victory to Lord Wellington at the Battle of Waterloo. And Wellington, or Arthur Wellesley, as he, he is, um, after his military career, became prime minister and gave all rights back to the Jews and the nonconformists so they could participate in public life. So God blessed this era and there was much social improvement. The Anglican Church took on a lot of the good principles of the Methodist Church. And this was all because Britain was blessing the Jews. Starting around 1830, um, the heresy of British Israel emerged. Now, I've never heard of this. And people believed that when God wrote Israel in the Bible, he actually meant Britain. And so all the promises made to Israel in the Bible should really be for Britain, <laughs> resulting in these groups believing that we don't need an Israel. Um, by the end of the 1800s, this approach was gaining a lot of influence, so there were two opposing factions, those praying on the one hand for the Jews to return to Israel, and those with the false theology of British Israel, who had no intention of a real Israel coming to pass. We get up to 1914, well, where World War I started, and it was a war which relied on the abundant supply of ammunition. And Britain was in real danger of not having enough raw materials to make sufficient shells to win the war. However, some Jewish scientists discovered, um, made some discoveries about materials that could be used. So they were able to create an abundant supply for which the Brit British government was very, very grateful. And so the Balfour letter was written, which said that if Britain acquired the promised land, that we would give it back to the Jews. However, shortly after this, Britain did acquire the lands of Abraham, Isaac and Israel. But following the ceasefire in 1918, the League of Nations, who were a forerunner of the United Nations, held a conference in San Remo in Italy, and they gave Britain a free hand to do what they wanted with the Jewish lands. But due to the British Israel heresy being so prevalent in the church, the church convinced the British government to only give 12.5% of the land back to the Jews. So again, not ideal. So over the next 20 years, Hitler came to power and following the Anschluss, which was the peaceful invasion of Austria in 1938, Hitler wrote a letter to Britain and France, which could well have been a cynical bluff, but saying, if you want all the Jews in Austria and Germany, which totaled about 600,000, you can have them. I'll even pay for their transport, but you must have them immediately. And so um, at the time, Britain and France were still two superpowers. So they convened a conference with the United States and the Commonwealth countries in Evian in France. And during this event, even though the states still wanted immigration as they were underpopulated, likewise Australia, the British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain and his government behind the scenes said we're not having any of them and we're all going to stick to the same story. So the US, France and the Commonwealth countries all refused to uh, the offer to take any Jews apart from the Dominican Republic. And sadly what this showed to Hitler is that none of these governments really cared about the Jews and so gave him a free hand to do what he wanted with them. Consequently the 600,000 Jews that could have been got out of Austria and Germany weren't taken and were left to perish under Hitler. Fortunately, Churchill was not involved in this decision or part of the government at the time. 
However, Golda Meir, who later became the Prime Minister of Israel, was physically present at the meeting. And um, because the Jews were being sidelined and representatives of the Jewish people weren't allowed to speak at the conference, they had to watch in silence whilst all the other countries that were there condemned them. And the thing that got to them most was the fact that they did it all in such polite, urbane language. So she decided that day that she'd always prefer their condemnation to their commiseration. And that kind of thinking has driven a lot of Israeli policy since. So that brings us to 1948, when the Jews came out of the camps, the death camps. They wanted to return to the Promised Land, which was then known as British Palestine. However, the British government had issued a standing order that any Jews trying to enter into Palestine should be shot on sight. To the credit of many of the conscripts in the British Army, they looked the other way and didn't shoot them, praise the Lord. However, God wanted Israel to exist as his firstborn nation, and in the same year, the US recognized Israel as a state, as did Stalin in the Soviet Union. However, sadly, Britain still didn't want this to go ahead, and therefore followed another period of demise for Britain, the power of Britain around the world was diminishing, but so too was the heresy that Britain was Israel in the Bible. During the British Empire, the Brits had built and paid for the Suez Canal, and in 1956, the Egyptian leader Nasser nationalised it. Now, the British Prime Minister at the time, Anthony Eden, although he was very pro-Arab, thought that Nasser was another potential Hitler. So he worked with the French and Israelis to get it back. And even though we were successful in that manoeuvre, the United States, to whom we were still heavily mortgaged from World War II, told us to give it back, which we did, causing great humiliation to the government. However, at that point, God saw that we tried to get it back and rewarded us with sending many famous um, Christian ministers to preach in the UK, people such as Billy Graham, and they say thousands, thousands came to the Lord. Uh, most notably the Queen, Queen Elizabeth II, and um, Billy Graham's relationship with the Queen flourished and he was adamant that she was born again. And also during this time, Britain got a lot of blessings. Culturally, we were the creators of the James Bond films, we had the Beatles and various other pop culture that was going around at the time, which which brought a lot of um, fame around the world for Britain, but also a lot of economic blessings. Um, in 1967, Israel won the Six Day War and God gave them back their lands. And this is just unbelievable, but sadly, the Brit British government's position at this time and since then to the present day is that these lands are illegally occupied by Israel. And so, Again, Britain suffered curses from the Lord in the 70s and 80s. There were many. We had power cuts. We had strikes of every kind. We had people queuing for bread in the streets. In the 80s, we had the minor strikes, which were incredibly violent and vicious and caused a lot of disunity between families and friends. There was social unrest. And, and even things like foot and mouth disease, which, which killed people a lot of cattle. And it's clear that even now, today, that the church in the UK still holds the government position, or many of them do, being illegal occupiers of Israel. And this was evidenced last year when Liz Truss, who was prime minister for a short amount of time, was considering to relocate the British embassy to Jerusalem. And the Archbishop of Canterbury and, the Arch and Archbishop Nichols of the Catholic Church rose up against this, declaring it was morally wrong, which was, you know, unbelievable. So the bottom line is that as a nation, we've been reluctant to bless Israel since 1920, notwithstanding all the other times that we've, we've treated them so terribly badly. And so I know that a lot of repentance has gone on, but I still feel there is a need for more and that we need to we need to repent for this and pray for the government and the church to alter its position and come into alignment with God's will. And so at this point, I'd like you to all stand and 
agreement with me whilst I declare uh, 2 Chronicles 7.14. And so, Father, you said in your scripture that if, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. And Lord, we just, we just ask you to forgive us for all, all the transgressions against the Jews, Lord, all the sins that we have committed against them. Lord, we just repent for these and help us to turn from our wicked ways, help us to turn the government and the church back to being in alignment with you. And also, as part of the remnant in the UK, um, and I hope you will join me in this, I'd like to declare our allegiance and support for Israel. And I'd like to um, ask you again to stand in agreement with me whilst I declare Ruth 116, which is, but Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For uh, wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. And so, Lord, we just we just ask you for your wisdom and your revelation to give us strategies that we may pray today that will bring our government and our church and this nation into alignment with you and your will for Israel. And I ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. And so if we can move to breakout groups now. Um, I've got, so the, the three kind of prayer points, but please feel free to uh, bring your own to the sessions, is number one, to repent for the United Kingdom's mistreatment of the Jews and our position against Israel. Number two, pray for the government and the church to alter its position and to come into alignment with God's will. And number three, to declare the UK remnant support for Israel. So, Shirley, are we okay to go into breakout groups, please? We are. How long would you like for the timing to be? Um, how, how, how long would you suggest? I've only got short prayers afterwards, so... I would have thought 20 minutes, um, Bernie, because okay. so often we just don't have enough time in the breakout groups. But yeah. as I'm sure you'll see that Shirley has very kindly put on the chat um, those prayer points, although obviously you can't see them in the um, breakout rooms. But uh, um, so I would have thought 20 minutes if you're in agreement, Bernie, with that. Yeah, no, that's perfect. Yeah. That's good. OK, thank you. Uh, I hope that everybody found that um, a um, a good time to reflect and to repent and to pray. But certainly in our group, um, it was a, a comprehensive um, coverage. So I wonder um, whether Shirley, you would be kind enough to uh, play the um, the second song, which is really a blessing. That's what we're seeking that the Lord uh, will bless, but bless with revelation on the whole subject of Israel and his beloved nation. And I think that's really what we all want, isn't it, from our own nation's point of view, the different perspectives to be a blessing. Mm. Well, says it all. I'd just like to reaffirm those words from Numbers 6, the ironic blessing. So to each one of you, the Lord bless you and watch, guard and keep you. The Lord may his face shine upon you and enlighten you and be gracious, kind, merciful and giving favour to you. The Lord lift up his approving countenance upon you and give you peace, tranquility of heart and life continually in Jesus name. So we commit to continue to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And we thank you, Father God, for delivering us all from every evil work and for the authority you have given to us with the name of Jesus. We love you and praise you every day with its new reasons. We praise you. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper that love you, the holy city. Peace be within your walls and prosperity within your palaces. 
Amen. Amen. Oh, Barry, yes. Bernie, go just ahead. before just before we finish, um, Margaret had a uh, a very um, brilliant prayer that I'd just like her to um, pray, if that's okay with everybody. Go ahead, Margaret. Yes. Yes, Father, we want to release a blessing over UK that it will come into its redemptive calling, which is a father nation. Father, we thank you that you have given this blessing, this, this calling, Father, this anointing to be a father nation for Israel. So, Father, we pray and we are in agreement with your will and your purposes for UK for uh, together with the other nations that have other redemptive calling, but UK, England specifically is a father nation. So Father, we call it out in the mighty name of Jesus that it will come. It will come over UK in your timing, in your, in your, in your according to your will and purposes in Jesus' mighty name, amen. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you, amen. Bernie. Thank you for, uh, and Jonathan for, um, bringing these um, facts that we can continue to pray into uh, for the relationship and thank everyone. Thank you for your faithfulness in joining the call. We do so appreciate it. We honor you for that. And uh, Shirley also, thank you for facilitating. We're so grateful to you. Can, so, can I just add something small? Sorry. Oh, uh, I didn't, what I said was not something from myself. It was something that Philip Quimby together with David Tidy has been speaking about about this redemptive calling of uk right. so it's not something i invented oh bless you for being the voice to speak it out <laughs> Amen. and thank you david for obviously being a part of that so thank you thank you again thank you for your time and uh, the lord bless each one of you amen shalom blessings to everyone and thank you jonathan thank you bernie thank you thank you thank you everybody thank you thank you